All right. Um, I'd like to call to order this session of the Alternative Energy Committee. Um, today is Tuesday, October 15th, 2024. Jay Wilson, present. Thomas Bickey, present. Denise Wolk, present. Sherry Quirk, select board liaison, present. Perfect. Um, at this point, we are missing Linda Burke. We hope she will be able to join us. Um, and um, Mike, you have agreed to take notes in her stead until she can come. Um, without... Um, Linda here at this point, I do not have the minutes for July 9th. Um, so we will defer that to the next meeting um, and um, review and approve the minutes for July 9th and for today's meeting during our next session. Do I need a there motion? To, uh -huh. Oh, perfect. Just in time. Hi, Linda, how are you? Good. Frazzled, but <laughs> <laughs> so let the record show that Linda is here. Yay! Um, and let's give her a minute to get settled. Um, as you do that, Linda, did you have an opportunity to do the minutes for July 9th? I don't have them. Oh. Okay, so why don't we, let's defer the minutes till the next meeting and then we'll take a look at them and, and we can go over them during our next meeting. Is that fair? Because okay. um, I, I don't recall ever getting them, but I could be, am I, I, was I supposed to take them from the website or is that something that No, I send them to you first. Right. I guess um, it might not, I, I don't recall getting them, but that doesn't mean I didn't and somehow in the fray of the last two months, I didn't somehow lose them. My apologies, the last two months have been insane for me. Um, so at, at this point, I'd like to defer the um, review of the minutes for July 9th until next meeting. Do we need a motion for that? I, I, I'm not that familiar with how this is supposed to work, so, okay, good. Um, why don't we uh, move into committee matters then? Um, and I had um, suggested for our agenda that we discuss the legislative bills um, and then look at um, updates on other items. I'd like to suggest that we move the updates forward and we'll do that first and then move into reviewing the legislative bills just so that when um, we move into that part, we can have an uninterrupted conversation. Does that work for everyone? Um, Perfect. So why don't we start with, um, we'd, um, at the last couple of meetings, we had uh, begun to discuss um, uh, the possibility of bringing on a consultant and uh, potential funding opportunities. Um, and I believe that you were looking into that. So were you looking back. into that, Mike? I'm sorry. Um, I think we both were. And I think I remember from the last meeting that we... Um, I recall anyway, uh, that we decided to defer any action on that until, um, because the, the, the question of um, this legislation. Okay. Maybe I am, well, that makes sense. Um, and again, please be patient with me as I learn how to do this. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, but that I, I think that is kind of a cart and a horse thing is is identifying what we're the legislative legislation is going to allow us to do, um, and maybe it would make more sense to flip back to discussing the legislative items first. Does that? Are you guys okay with my presto changeo mm -hmm. <laughs> moves here? So why don't we why don't we move back? If we to, want to change back even one more step, I did distribute the minutes to everybody. You did right after the last meeting, so we okay. could vote on them. If not that anybody remembers them. But. Um, 
Do we want to step back for a moment and see if we have these minutes? It was on July 15th. Um, can it, let's see if everyone can get to them. Although, Tom, you wouldn't I, be able I to. I did look at them. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. I look at everything. I just, I just... <laughs> huh. um, I don't, I don't see them in the box, but. Ah, seven on on the fifteenth at five twenty four p.m. Oh, they're there. There they I are. What? Let's take a minute to review. Tom, are you okay with going on your memory? Yeah. For those. Yeah. Does everybody else have them? Yes. Do you have them? Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Everybody had a chance to yep. read through it. Anyone have any questions or a motion to approve the minutes as? I make a motion to approve the minutes of the July 9th meeting as written and sent out July 15th. I'll second that. Uh, all those a, 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 an agreement? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Um, thank you, Linda. <laughs> um, so I, I was thinking about how we might be able to discuss these two pieces of legislation. Um, the Senate bill passed, correct? On uh, My understanding is that the Senate bill actually passed the Senate on... Um, July 17th. Is that correct? Or was that the House bill? That may be the House bill. No, the Senate bill 2838 passed on okay. July 17th. Um, the House bill has not yet been voted on, according to the it, website. I thought it was. I thought it was, and that's why they were in a um, conference. conference committee. I'm, I'm looking at the voting, the votes. Um, it said that there is no roll call vote for this particular bill on the, so on the legiscan. From the website, what's going on? Yeah. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a service called InstaTrack. Does anybody have it? From work. Their, their own work? No. Um, it helps. Yeah. It's a paid service, though. Okay. Um, but there, are, I've read articles. Okay, that they that they had voted I on think it. So, okay, is that what everybody? I I have to admit I have been sadly out of the loop on things for a couple of months, um, and I'm trying to get back into the saddle. Um, the year was terrible between COVID and starting a new job. It was just sorry. It, yeah, it was passed so on July 17th. The House bill, according. Okay, so I wonder uh, if the Senate. So the I wonder if the Senate took that. it up on the same day. June twenty fifth. Okay. 
So the, the, the Senate passed it on June 25th? Yes. And the, yes. And, the, and, the, and, the, um, and the House passed it on, June 7, on July 17th. July 17th, yeah. Okay, I can see where I got mixed up because it's on the vote for the Senate bill that it says the House passed to be engrossed. Okay, can someone define what engrossed means? Does that is that like reconciliation in a it normally means that bill it's or? a done deal, it just needs to be sealed by the kind of the state clerk. Um, so it is a funny on 625. But it was also referred to the House Ways and Means, which means it has a financial component. So that usually slows things down nicely. Well, I mean, the, there was a financial component in both bills. Yeah. A fairly substantial portion of it was around <coughs> rate setting and Yeah, and it's, if it, it affects the, the budget, the state's right. budget. Right. Um, so, but these have at least made the first hurdle. So yeah. the, I, I would imagine <coughs> short of them killing it in committee, they're probably going to end up being passed, do you think? Um. So the difficulty right now, though, is they're not going to be in formal session until they seat the new legislature in January. So any one person can say no, and that kill that ends that. So it has to get refiled in January. Hmm. Everything has to get refiled. The entire bill would have to be refiled yeah. in January. Every bill that's on the docket still no sitting around has to get stuck. refiled. No, I know it, this is, <laughs> it, it happens every two years like this. Yeah. Oh boy. My, my understanding is that the two bills that were passed were different and they needed to be reconciled. Right. Reconciliation did not happen in time uh, for this final process. passage. And there were quite adamant differences of opinion that I frankly don't completely understand and there's been periodic chatter about the governor calling back the legislature in order to pick up or to deal with certain things. And this is one yeah. that always makes the list. So I, I guess I'd be curious to know whether anybody else has heard about it being. No, that's pretty done. accurate. And then when they called back, that's when they can do the formal session. So it's a majority rules. I have heard something time. differently. Okay. So I am looking at a, a website that's saying they could recon. Oh, I'm sorry. They could convene a special session. They could yes. convene an informal session, or they could pass it in the next next yeah. next session. My um, someone I know who is a, uh, a policy analyst for an energy, a green energy organization, says that the word on the street is the Senate and the House have come to a new compromise climate bill that could go public as soon as this week, but it could be longer. Okay. And it is likely that the citing provisions will be like what is in. The House bill and some aspects of gas utility reform from the Senate bill will be in the final bill, but everyone's being pretty tight-lipped. I think whatever the, which is, I mean, it sounds like it's going forward. It's just that I think that refile is still necessary in January. Yeah, but they would just refile at the level that they, you know, that it got to. Yeah. I would suggest that we could say that the status is unclear at this time since we have conflicting information you know, feedback from different organizations. So rather than saying, you know, yes, this has been agreed and they're going to do this with just, I mean, I, I'm more comfortable just saying it's unclear what the status of whether there's, you know, a compromise bill, whether anything's going to get done, whether, you know, so it's, I mean, it's all speculation at this point, so. And it seems like kind of a wasted effort to talk about any version of it if well, that, we don't know what. Well, is that's what I'm happen. saying. So it's unclear where we stand <clears throat> with the bill until until we have something in hand that says right. this is what the legislature has passed. It doesn't really make any sense to discuss the pros and cons of the House and the Senate bills because none of that may even appear in the right. And the last know, time we some met, compromise, it, so. and the last time we met, it felt as though they may be between then and now they may have passed this. So, um, and again, to my head, it looked like they had passed the House bill, but I misunderstand how the process works here. Um, Tom, that makes sense. Um, 
I, I guess p part of what my thinking about these bills is for forewarned is forearmed. Thinking about how the legislature is thinking about. Um, I, I know one of the things that we had discussed before that we were concerned about was the possibility of this new commission being able to override um, the will of towns. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't see anything when I reviewed both of the bills. I didn't see anything that looked very specifically as though they were saying that. But there were a couple of sections where it made me wonder. Um, if they might be able to do that. So that was one of the considerations. But the other was, you know, that it might provide opportunities for resources, funding, um, and, um, and other opportunities for groups like ours to tap into the state commission's resources. Um, so those were a couple of reasons why I've been interested in it. And I, I was hoping we could have this kind of a discussion about it. Um, um, and, and, you know, Tom, I think you're right. It doesn't make a lot of sense to try to make any decisions, but I think discussing what could happen, um, because it looks like something will, some version of this looks like it's going to go through, yeah. um, yes. you know, and, and, and where they seem to agree in both texts, I would imagine will probably pass. Yes. It's, it's where they, the big conflicts were. Um, but that, I think more importantly for, the town is, yeah. is that what local control are we going to have? Right. Is it, this going to be basically a top down, you know, you can't do this and you can't prevent this and you can't do this. And it seems like that's where they're headed that, you know, basically the, the local communities will have very little say in, you know, future, you know, development of, solar and wind and everything else and batteries, whatever. Um, that's, that's kind of the feeling I get from reading everything that I've seen is that we're almost going to become redundant in the sense that here's what you have to do. We have zoning and planning and they'll adjust their guidelines to fit whatever the state says you must do. So. I don't see a lot of local. I mean, that's my personal opinion. Is that a, do other people agree that that appears to be the way that they're going to ask us to well, adjust zoning and planning? Some yeah, there. local control I, here. So. I, I, I always I take the pessimistic viewpoint, and then if it doesn't happen, I'm always better off. You know. Right. I mean, because I didn't really read it that way, but maybe I missed some big no, section. You yeah. know. I mean, I. It, it, you know, from from what I had seen, um, you know, it, 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 it. Well, take the battery issue, for example. Right. You know, that the state said, well, we consider batteries, battery storage, a part of yeah. a solar field. Done. No discussion. You know, we don't really have any input on that. We, and we already have, like Tesla has a huge battery facility in Carver. And uh, they just went ahead and did it. And didn't get any approval from the town, from Carver, anybody. So, and it's a done deal. So it's already there. I attended a meeting um, last week that was about um, about this bill and about uh, transmission um, transmission questions because of this the grid and the presentation was by someone named Mike Judge from. Uh, the Office of, of Energy and Environmental Affairs. And what they're saying is that without reforming the permitting process, we will not meet our greenhouse, Massachusetts will not meet our greenhouse gas reduction limits. And the way they describe it is that, um, and I'm reading a bullet point off a, off a um, PowerPoint slide that I cut and pasted, all state and local agencies that would otherwise have a permitting role would be able to automatically intervene and would participate by issuing statements of recommended permit conditions. But the permitting would consolidate all state, regional, and local permits for larger projects, uh, which wasn't defined, into one consolidated permit that would be issued by the Energy Facility Siting Board. Mm. So this is when, when um, people talk about the siting reform, this is what they're talking about, so that Currently, you have to get up to 15 different permits, and each one of those 
involves a permit decision and potentially has, a, has an appeal and then an appeal result. What they're saying is, you know, you get all the input at once, the issue the permit, and then there can be a review and an option for an appeal to the SJC, to the Supreme Judicial Court. And then that's the process. Um, for the large projects. For the large projects, yeah. but I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't, Somehow, somewhere thinks, there's a definition for large and small. 25 large. megawatts. Yeah. And is 25 megawatts large like with it? That's what I was wondering. Is the project, say the project over by where I'm crossing, is that 25 megawatts? No? We don't have any 25 megawatt projects. Oh, not in this okay. town. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. All right. I just I don't uh, know, if the, know if there's one in the state, actually. <laughs> oh, really? It's, I mean, and maybe the, maybe it's because of the 15 approvals that have, they have to yeah. go through. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I guess to Tom's point, that's sort of the, there's the balance there between, well, I, I, I do want to have sort of a bigger discussion about this because I've been thinking about this issue a lot about, um, so this, you know, we have these greenhouse gas um, targets and apparently we're not going to meet them unless siting reform is, is, happens. So I had a discussion with somebody about this issue about, well, why should, and essentially I came down to saying, why should Wareham, which is for whatever reason has preserved a lot of open space, have to bear the burden of having, a, say, solar development that we don't want to supply power to Boston? And this person said, yeah, why is it that all the rich people have to pay for the <laughs> health care of the poor people? We're a commonwealth. So I'm wondering whether... I'm having this conflict in my head. The state is saying, we need to do this. The legislature has met and is going to apparently come out with a bill that it maybe is going to weaken our local control. Yeah. Should we fight it? Should we be like Milton fighting the, the MBTA? Route and that's exactly what it would be like, yeah. Milton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So would, do, is that, I'm not sure that's where I want to be. So. Well, I also don't know if the town has the wherewithal to do that. <laughs> yeah. Does it? No, well, but Milton does because they have the money. Right. I mean, uh, we're not milk. <laughs> what I would say is I don't think the analogy t between taxes and solar projects is 100% square. Because um, I think the what concerns people in town, and I'm not not aligning with either side. I'm yeah. just sure. saying what what how I think it stacks up. But the taxes are uh, being paid by people with the ability to pay the taxes. And the question with the solar and battery is, is it safe to be around these these things? And so and so that's that's really I think a question. I think it's really hard to. Well, first of all, I, I don't want to talk too much because I'm not supposed to. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you also have vast experience experience in the industry, and just having that at the table is so important. Well, outside of your role as a select person, on one hand, I mean I. What I would say is I'd take the 25 megawatts or more and say that is probably of less concern. 25 megawatts is 100 acres. Yeah, it's a huge. Yeah. That's a big, yeah. I mean, it's possible that that would be proposed here. Um, anything's possible. But um, when it comes to local control, what, what this town has seen is a lot of relatively small Five, projects, yeah. uh, aggregating to, you know, a large number of acres and, and projects for the town. I would say on one hand, uh, what you can say is under current law, uh, the law is very much in favor of solar development, in favor of solar development with few resources for the planning board or any other board that's involved. And not a huge knowledge basis at this point of impacts, which, you know, over time would hopefully be addressed. But right now, I think the planning board, if anyone has seen any recent meetings, is very, um, very tied up with this issue of additional solar in town. And I think part of the issue is being worried about what we all don't know. And so 
one could argue that additional resources from the state could be a good thing and a net gain. Um, on the other hand, it looks like the um, standards for the towns for these smaller projects are going to be developed on the state level. Mm -hmm. And so, as you said, Tom, we don't know what those could be. We can be very concerned about what they might be and concerned about the, uh, the impact and input that towns like ours can have in those. Uh, but it's hard to know, you know, what, what's going to be better in the long run. It, you know, as to the town's resources, I think the town is very strained. Uh, but, um, and, and I would say, tr trying to make up its mind about where to put resources and what makes sense. So, you know, there's just a lot of uncertainty right now with, and the, I know the goals are there, and it's absolutely right to say it's going to be really hard to meet the goals. I would say as someone who's been in the energy business, um, I, I think I'd always worry about um, fads. And I know I've said this to at least some of you. I worry that the energy industry is like, if you've ever been uh, scuba diving or snorkeling, it's like squid underwater. You watch them, they're all the same color and they're swimming in the same direction. And then suddenly they all turn color and they turn exactly at the same moment. The energy industry is a bit like that. Um, right now in this state, it's solar and batteries and wind. That's going to be what solves our problem. I worry that this is going to be something that cha passes by the by when another technology comes and a town like ours could be at risk for abandoned projects and, um, and whatever harms that may have resulted from it. So, I mean, that, that's all to say, it's really hard to know what makes sense at this point. But I do have a suggestion. I would love to hear that. I would okay. love to entertain your suggestion. Okay. I, well, um, I think that this board may want to go to the planning board. And so, well, I heard something the other night while I was in one of these meetings which have become very contentious. And um, one of the members of the planning board said, why aren't we thinking about cranberry box? Which is why I'm so happy that you're here. And you're here. What, you know, cranberry bogs have been sort of off the table for this town, as far as I can tell. Although I'm not sure that that position has been sustained in court. Um, what about cranberry box? Right, whether well, solar can be built. Oh, well, solar over cranberry box? No. Well, I mean, wasn't realistic, there... realistically, if you don't want to grow cranberries, you can put a solar field over a cranberry bog. Right. But effectively, um, you know, they need photosynthesis to, to grow and to produce a crop. And if you're covering, you know, even half of the bog with solar panels, that half of the bog's not going to then half and and then it's barely profitable now mm -hmm. and if you cut the yield in half it's financial ruin right. the only cranberry operations i I, mean, I won't call it a cranberry bog the only cranberry operations that might be able to do that would be you know adjoining upland land that you know has been used you know like for let's say uh sanding or whatever and so they have adjoining acres that are fairly level of you know sufficient size and that makes the number of those people very you know the, the population of indiv individual cranberry operations very small that people have that with the exception of, of a few very large grows in the town that might have adjoining land but it's it's unrealistic to think that you're going to grow cranberries on a cranberry bog what what if you were to say uh growing cranberries is no longer going to be the purpose of well, this. Well, that, that's my point. If you if you have, if you want to take a, a cranberry operation and turn it into a solar field, right? You know that that's a, a viable option. I would say, recognizing that it's no longer going to be a cranberry operation, it's going to be a solar field that happens to be situated in a wetland. 
So that and that been, brings up a sorry. whole and that um, creates that creates another whole set of conditions because the <clears throat> the bogs here in Massachusetts are different than they are in other growing areas. Many of them are in the flow through bogs. They're in stream valleys, and the irregular shaped bogs are usually uh, old kettle holes that are filled with peat, and that peat can range from four or five feet to 25 or 30 feet of peat. Mm -hmm. So depending upon where it is and, you know, the the, um, the timeline for sedimentation and everything else. So if you're going to put a cranberry bog, if you're going to take a cranberry bog that's got 25 or 30 feet of peat in it, you can't put pilings in the peat. That's got to go all the way down to the glacial till in the bottom of that thing. And then it becomes astronomically expensive and the engineering required to have all those, you know, pilings all at the same elevation for all of the panels just is really unrealistic. Isn't peat, um, doesn't peat store a lot of carbon? Yeah. It does, at a tremendous amount. Okay. Yeah. It's all carbon, actually. So what if we were to say... Well, I, I guess my basic question, I don't know nearly as much as you do about uh, the sort of the uh, hydrogeology, et cetera, but I'm wondering if the comment that I heard from a planning board member that we should really be looking at cranberry bogs for solar, if it has any, any legs or not. As I said, Sounds I mean, like I, I can't speak for individual cranberry growers, but... I'll, I'll go back to my right. point. If they want to cram, if they want to run a cranberry operation, it's unrealistic to think that you're going to put solar on it. So somebody's going to make a decision that they want to get out of the cranberry mm -hmm. growing business, and they want to put in a solar field. Uh, that's, you know, that's those are two different things that I personally don't think are compatible. I just don't see how you could grow cranberries. I mean, we already know that, you know, in, in small bogs that are in narrow uh, river valleys with forested uplands, that the yields along the perimeter of those bogs where they're shaded are much, much lower. Right. So if you're going to shade the whole bog with the uh, solar yeah. panels, right. you're not going to grow cranberry. I mean, realistically, it wouldn't be viable. And then you have to think about the logistics of even if somebody wanted to attempt to do it, they'd have to be high enough up. Right to be able to manage the vines. And then you have to worry about irrigation. How do, you, how do you irrigate a bog that has solar panels on it? And how do you spray chemicals on the bog? Because some cranberry bogs are sprayed by helicopter. Mm -hmm. uh, other ones are sprayed by chemigation. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole series of obstacles that, that make the two things impractical. I mean, if you're looking for places to do it, you'd be better off putting it in shopping center parking lots and just put everybody under a canopy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that makes more sense than putting them on a cranberry bog. Well, it's, also, it's also a built environment. So right. you're not taking yeah. natural resources out of... I, as I recall, um, in, in years past when I so, served on the Solar Bylaw Committee, a few years ago, there had actually been an experiment with doing solar over cranberry bogs. There was a, there was a, I don't know if it was UMass that did it there. I know they have their extension um, out here uh, nearby, but um, the, the Reader's Digest condensed version of that is, yeah, it doesn't work because even if you're able to, um, they even tried shifting, like putting the um, panels on a, uh, some kind of automatic shifting where it would shift and so that the, the uh, they would rotate so that the crops would get sun for some period of the day. And it, it the yield of the cranberries was less than half of what it should have been. Um, and that's not, and that's just with the shading. It has nothing, it, it didn't take into consideration the need for irrigation or fertilizer or and what the impact of that would be on the panels. Plus, I mean, if you think about Carver, where they've tried putting in a solar field over um, uh, a wetland, 
I mean, the, the materials they had to use to do it, they took, they put in creosote poles and then yeah. they ended up having to take them all out. Right. And now so, they're putting in steel pilings and there's still nothing hanging on theirs. So let's, let's back up. Yeah, let's take this and tweak it just a little bit. Let's say um, the growing of cranberries on this bog is no longer viable. One of the town's other priorities is nitrogen reduction because of the nitrogen levels in some of our rivers need to be reduced. And there are very, very expensive ways to do this. Um, I think taking some bogs out of cultivation is a way to reduce nitrogen. I don't know. I don't know how this all lines up and how oh. the economics line up. But take the bog out of cultivation and turn it into a solar field. Uh, I have a couple, just a couple of comments to that. Um, the first one is is that typically cranberry growers only put about twelve pounds of actual nitrogen per acre on a cranberry bog. So the cranberry growers of all agricultural crops, they probably use the least amount of nitrogen because a lot of nitrogen ends up with a bog full of vines and no fruit. Right. So that there's a misconception that cranberry growers are using a lot of nitrogen. In fact, homeowners, there was a, UMass did a study quite a number of years ago, like 15 or 17 years ago, and they found out that the average homeowner on a half acre lot is using like five or six times the amount of actual nitrogen on their lawn than a cranberry grower uses on an acre of cranberry bog. So wow. that, that, that's one issue. Mm -hmm. The second issue is, is that I actually had a research project out on, um, on the Cape quite a number of years ago where I put uh, installed automated monitoring equipment in the headwaters above the cranberry bog and then in the bog and at the, the outflow of about a 14 acre cranberry bog. And the water coming in, coming in from the headwaters came from a subdivision that was all on septic systems. And uh, I monitored that was, they were all automated samplers. They took flow weighted samplers over the course of the whole growing season for three different seasons. And it turned out actually that the highest levels of nitrogen were in the water coming into the cranberry bog. Hmm. And the lowest levels of nitrogen were coming out of the cranberry bog. So in fact, what was happening was, is the cranberry bog was scrubbing water out of the, out of the receiving water to the detriment of the yield of the bog. Huh. So, because it, it, it was getting too much nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So in reality, the, that they put very little on. <clears throat> and if there's additional nitrogen coming in, they're like any other plant, they'll grab onto that nitrogen and then they grow much vigorous vines and less fruit. Mm -hmm. So the outcome was the water was cleaner coming out of the bog than it was going in. So the bog was not the problem. And the bog suffered from the high nitrogen water that was coming from the urban environment. So it was totally the opposite of what the community wanted. The, you know, the community wanted, oh, those nasty cranberry growers are, are filling up the bay with nitrogen. And it turned out actually that it was the people who were complaining about the cranberry bog that were actually generating more nitrogen, you know, effluent nitrogen in the in the stream than it was in the cranberry bog and to the detriment of the bog. So we have to be careful about how, you know, we look at, you know, it's easy to point the finger at somebody else and say it's this because I was on a committee many, many years ago that was looking at, you know, reducing nitrogen. And we met at Mass Maritime with a whole group of different people, including Buzz's Bay Coalition and a bunch of other people. And, uh, and I argued that, you know, we should have restrictions on the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that people can put on their, on their property. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sense. everybody had a, an argument for how it would be difficult to do that, you know, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, it was like, well, but that's the biggest source of runoff and nitrogen in the water and from the sewage treatment plant is, is also a very large 
point source contributor of nitrogen. But, you know, they talked about, well, reducing nitrogen at the sewage treatment plant and, you know, developing best management practices for the cranberry growers. But somehow or other, the people that generate the most nitrogen, they didn't want to do anything for them. So you could put restrictions on. Nobody could buy more than X many pounds of nitrogen. You could have, you know, surveys of how much acreage people have, and you're allowed to buy this many pounds of nitrogen. I mean, it's a bureaucratic. It's an enforcement. It's an it's a unenforceable kind of bureaucratic nightmare. But, you know, an educational program that told people not to do that, you know, was never even implemented as well. So I was on that committee, too. <laughs> and um, I, I thought the takeaway from it was that there was a large contingent of people with you and me and maybe another handful of people excluded who went into this discussion assuming that the problem was the cranberry yeah. growers. Right. And there was nothing they we could say that would steer them away from that. <laughs> and finally, you'll recall that Somebody said, well, why don't we do a study? Why don't we look at this? And so the Buzzards Bay Coalition actually did look at it, and it turned out that, no, it wasn't the cranberry growers, <laughs> as Tom said. <laughs> and, and that part of it was never publicized. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Well, and I, you know, I, I think that there's a disconnect. There are a lot of people who make assumptions about, because they don't know. It's like, I've never walked through a cranberry bog. I want to someday, but it's on, it's on my list. Um, oh, you should do it within the next couple of weeks during harvest. <laughs> yeah, That's during the harvest. best time. I'll be in touch with you. <laughs> yeah. um, but, um, but I, I, you know, again, I, as someone who lives in town and adjacent to the cranberry bogs and the solar farms that we have and the potential for battery energy storage, I, I you know, one of the things that we have talked about doing in this committee is helping to promote understanding of the things, of the issues around energy, um, uh, alternative energy. Uh, cranberries are such a big part of our town. I think that that um, making it clear what's doable and what's not, I think would be also important for us to think about um, how can we communicate that? Because I, you know, I, I, I hadn't ever really thought about, I, I've thought, Kind of like what Sherry brought up. It's like, well, if a cranberry bog was getting ready to be decommissioned, or they're going to take it out and 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 you know stop, wouldn't that be a smart place to put a, a solar uh, installation? Well, because the, the geology land, was the land is if, already if the cleared. geology was acceptable, but right. But yeah. but that the cranberry bogs are in those places for a reason because the geology set itself up for that, yeah. right? In this area, because most of them are. I, I, if, if I hear in you correctly, Tom, most of them are in places that have large um, uh, concentrations yeah, for the most, of peat. I mean, and Massachusetts, and, and there's other growing areas as well, but like Wisconsin, for example, most of the cranberry bogs in Wisconsin are on uplands and they're manufactured wetlands. So underneath the most of the cranberry bogs in Wisconsin is regular glacial till material. And they actually, you know, lower the, the ground surface so they can get closer to the water table to build a bog. But here, you know, we have naturally occurring, you know, bogs that, and, and the issue is, is there'll be, you know, bogs that perhaps uh, growers don't want to continue growing cranberries on that might meet the criteria where it's fairly shallow to some basal material that they can put pilings in. But then there's going to be other ones where a guy might say, well, I want to, you know, stop growing cranberries and I want to put solar out here. And then he finds out that the bog has 30 or 40 feet of peat in it. Right. And it's just, you know, the amount of, of, uh, of footings and stuff that would have to go in there to make the thing stable would, would never be realized right. no matter how much power you generated. So well, it would be a losing proposition, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, there's the trade-off too if the peat is a, a large... Um, a magnet for sequestration of, of um, <coughs> that may be the greater value carbon. Yes. Yeah. yeah, if it's already if it's already yeah. sequestering um, uh, uh, the the 
and stuff. Carbon. stuff yeah. Carbon. And, and, uh, yeah. If it's sequestering, we don't want to mess with that. Right. Right. Um, right. You know. So. So. Yeah. It, 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 you know. I guess. The other question is: Is I, I don't know enough about cranberry farming to know how profitable it is. You'd mentioned before, Tom, that if you took half of a field out of production, that would be enough to sink most people. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it doesn't seem to be a real high margin, but um, are the most of the cranberry growers in our area, you know, solvent? Do they plan on staying in the business? Is it is it a growing concern or is this something where as, again, as we as a community look to where these kinds of installations for, I'm going to take it back to energy, um, alternative energy, where either solar or battery energy storage or something can be done in an area that is previously disturbed by farming. Is Are there going to be, do you predict well, that there could be farmers that are looking to make some alternative use of their lands or are going to they, I, farming? I'll, I'll say this, that cranberry growers have made more money in the past than they are making now. I can't speak for individual growers because, you know, that depends on, you know, their management and their acreage and the, the varieties and stuff that they have. But but they were making more money than per acre than they're making now. And um, uh, nobody's going nobody's going into the cranberry business, new people thinking that they're going to make be viable farmers. So, and I'll just leave it at that, that. The established people that have no debt and, uh, you know, are multi-generational, you know, you know, they can probably make a, you know, a reasonable um, go of it. But nobody's, there aren't very many people buying into Cranberry Box. So it's. So let's tweak this a little more. Um, is what, what I'm searching for is um, there, there is a lot of opposition right now, I'll say, um, or, you know, sort of a critical mass of opposition um, on the planning board. And if you've been watching the uh, meetings, you will see this, um, to deforestation, for example, mm -hmm. lots of. I'm searching for what is it that that is okay? What solar development is would be okay by, say, a you know critical mass of people? I mean, I I hate to be in the position of saying no to everything. Not that I'm in that position or ever was, uh, but it would be good if we had some way of saying if you do this. And even for purposes of showing the state at a point when they're developing guidelines, um, if you do this, uh, then that's something the town is okay with. Yeah. So I'm thinking the order that the public would be happy would be they'd be okay with rooftop, but we ran into that conversation about not every roof can support. But going forward, you could say all new construction yeah. has to have solar on it. We could also do a survey of what's already in town and see if companies have looked into putting on rooftop and what their barrier was. And if they haven't looked into it, why not? Uh, so rooftop and then the canopy idea, because most people are like, hmm, doesn't matter if the mall looks any worse or better than today than it does <laughs> with or without. Um, I would say that next, though, they're going to think, oh, cranberries, you know, because that's, they, they, they're okay going out, you know, you can see why politically, you're going to say, well, no, the cranberry companies are okay to go after, but we can't tell cities, people to do away with their green lawn. I know it's, you know, just, it's torture, right? It just is. And the enforcement is a nightmare. I mean, how right. do you do that? Uh, uh, so, so that's where I think, uh, so, I mean, but the, what I've read is that it's impossible to think that we're going to be self-sufficient on just rooftop solar. Uh, but it's still would get us there. So just do a, if I can step back to, to a broader, because I worked with cities and towns, you know, that was my job. And so uh, uh, you, we have a governor who's very, going to be very aggressive about the solar. So she may not be, she might be like, okay, well, that's too bad. That's 25 
feet worth of peat, but we need to still figure it out. I guess you, yeah, they won't let go of that. But so, uh, but I, 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 I think it's okay. But I, I think it would be we money would be better well spent if we said, okay, we have a lot of flat top yeah. uh, commercial oh, buildings yeah, sure. in town, and that we just say offhand, well, they weren't really designed for solar panels, but we really don't know that. So it might behoove yes. us to get a grant that says we want to look at all the solar all the flat top buildings in town and have an engineering study of these buildings to see if in fact they can take the load of these, are eligible. Of exactly. these solar panels. And, and, and from that study say, okay, this one can, you know, has the feasibility of getting this many panels, yeah. maybe only a third of the roof has solar panels and this one can be completely covered with solar panels. But to just simply say, well, the buildings weren't designed for solar yeah. panels. You know, there's really no data to say one way or the other whether well, that, they can get them or not get them. Or how many companies actually looked into it? Like, I don't know. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's where maybe a, a grant from the state yeah. that we would say, give us some money so we can actually do an engineering load study of all these different buildings right. to see if, you know, what's feasible where. Yeah, so this, the bill says that there's apparently going to be a fund for big sightings and small sightings. So right. somewhere in there, there would be great if there was, and that's the same kind of thing that putting our input in would not be a bad idea. Um, I do think because uh, the governor's being very aggressive about this, I think what the next step was that they sat back and looked at the cities and towns and went, oh, this is all over the place. Like town A has 15 permits, town B seven, town C three. We need to organize this together. And this is, you know, this normally happens a lot of times with uh, private industry that kind of goes across borders and and wants more uniformity because it's such a pain in the neck to figure out what A, B, and C are all doing. But th in this case, it's not a private industry. It's the governor himself, the office itself saying this. And so they're going to they're gonna say, okay, let's do some uni uniformity. And a lot of small cities and towns are going to say, yeah, I'm okay with the uniformity because we don't have the staff to figure out what a proper solar, you know, uh, application should look like, especially the small ones. Unfortunately, in the state, we run in a state that, you know, coming, uh, having uh, lived three decades in the city of Malden, yeah, I think I've said this before, but it's five square miles of 65,000 people without rooftops. <laughs> <laughs> the front lawn here is considered a park in Malden. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's just no, yeah. it just can't happen. No and that's why, you know, places like Western Mass, who always feel cheated because Boston's not centrally located, <laughs> are going to be mad about whatever they do. Uh, but it does make sense, sense to have some uni uniformity. And the second thing I think is a big thing is that the saying, and you only have so much time. Right. I mean, right. Yeah. cities and towns can drag their feet right. forever for a regular house subdivision. <laughs> you know, and they're going to say, no, this is your outer limit for time. You need right. to do this in time. Right. And um, hopefully that these funds will offer technical assistance to cities and towns to kind of have a uniform application where they're going to want to hear from cities and towns, know the Mass Municipal Association. And, uh, you know, and, you know, if you're running late on this, call us in. We'll try to help you go through it. That's looking at it positively. Yeah. Uh, but there's going to be, they're going to lean into cities and towns because this is her, one of her babies. Right? To, give you, to give you an idea, there was a statistic in that presentation I alluded to earlier that we are, to meet our solar energy goals, we need to, uh, we need seven times the amount of solar we have yeah. now. And I don't know about you, but in my neighborhood, it's about every other house has solar. So when you think about the scale of the, the the scale of the problem is huge. Right. And which gets complicated for transmission. That presentation, I, I, uh, they're my notes. I think oh. that presentation is going to be posted to uh, to a state website, and then I can I can share the link. Okay. That should, you that should can be share the link in the with us. That would yeah, be there were wonderful. there were two presentations, and it was there was one about well the transmission challenges. Of, yeah. Of building the infrastructure, the land-based infrastructure, just to get the power where it needs to go. Is, right. It, or, well, and that's been daunting. a challenge for siding solar here before. Yeah. Because it, it has so, solar needs to be currently the way that solar works. It has to be sited in such a place that it can be transmitted through the existing yeah. infrastructure. Now, I understand that they're 
the power companies are trying to address that, but how many years down the road is that? And it, it, you know, it's the course, sure. the horse and the cart. Yeah. Um, they're going to build the they're they're going to build infrastructure based on what they think is going to be built in terms of solar, but right. they don't. They don't know. We've got a chicken and an egg here. Yeah. And so, yeah. so uh, you know, I mean, so we had at, at one point, um, I, I'm going to circle back a little bit. Um, Can I just interrupt one yeah. second? I got to run because I have another commitment, so I'm going to have to take off. No, I, it's a good you. discussion, but I, I apologize you, for Before taking off. Before you run off, can we agree for a date for our next meeting? Or can we try to set a, a, a meeting date before you go? Or is that... Do you have time before you have to run out? I know. My schedule's pretty open. So. I would imagine a lot of people are going to Alan Slavin's retirement party. I've already been. You've already been. <laughs> yes. I, I'm dying to see the inside of the um, of the place. How is um, how is November? What about November? Would Would y'all be able to do November nineteenth? I'll be in Sicily. Nice. Good for you. I, I will not be here the 12th. Um, Neither will I. I'll be in Sicily. Oh, well, look at you. <laughs> are you there? Are you back on the following Tuesday? Back? Oh, no. No. We're getting back back to five um, weeks. What about oh, the weeks? What, what are you going to lay? Uh, you're like Don oh, Corleone. So, you're going to lay low so, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be Tomless in November. Um, how's the 19th for everybody else? Well, I, I won't be here, but I could do it remotely. I got to run. Okay. Um, thank you, Tom. Sure. Enjoy Sicily. Yes. Um, okay. Well. Nineteenth uh, is okay for me. Yep. Nineteenth. Okay. Why don't we say the nineteenth, um, and I will I will get things built uh, and and at the next meeting. Same time slot. Yeah. John, how's that looking for you? I make anything work. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Um, that's, so I, I want to say, uh, going back to this conversation, does anybody have a hard stop before? Um, I do. Okay. I have to leave at 5.30. I've got okay. a select word at 7. Tonight. Okay. Can we all agree to be out of here by 5.30? Yep. Okay. I know this is, I, I, I run a loosey-goosey meeting. Okay. Um, so, so. Here was one other thing. I know that we had talked about doing the, um, and, and in the works had a, um, uh, a, a survey um, was in the works before. I, I would think we should revisit that um, after we have the, the, this discussion um, and, and think about how we can, um, after we finish this discussion, revisit the, the survey um, and think about how to break that up in such a way that we can get some of this information that we were just talking about. You know, maybe doing like a commercial businesses survey of who has a rooftop that's conducive, just as a start, just to just put a flag in the ground around that. I love the idea of asking them why, if they did look at it, why didn't they pursue it? Right. Right. Because that's a useful you know, thing to know. I mean, I think a certain number of buildings are probably going to say because the, 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 the buildings we're in are not owned by us. You know, they're owned by a shopping center, or whatever. I know that it, when we did the alternative uh, or the solar uh, bylaw committee, there was um, a conversation about that. And as I recall, Ken Buckland told us then that a number of buildings in town, uh, uh, large buildings in town are built with what they call a floating roof system. And that can't support solar. Um, but again, we could be looking at future builds it's like if you're going to build in this town and you want to build a commercial structure in this town, you need to make it conducive to having rooftop solar. I, I think I looked at this issue once. Yeah. I think it may take a state legislation to enable a town. And that to might be where we are with this yeah. new law. We're under the International Building Code, aren't we? This one that's kind of uniform. My understanding with most of those codes is that those are minimums, and states can add on yeah. top of those. I'm wondering if, even if that has oh, if that moved on to saying. including it. I don't know. Did we? And we can also search the text of those bills to see if they have the word roof in them. I don't know. So, so there was one other consideration or one other concern. I oh, I'm sorry. Go. No, I just want to. So Sherry actually started this discussion by yes. saying we should go to the planning board, and I'm right. not sure that. You completed that thought. Yeah, let's go back. Let's go to that loop. 
So I think what, what I was thinking about is uh, I think the planning, to the extent that something this committee does is within the jurisdiction of the planning board, uh, it would be the right thing to do to go to the planning board and say, we're thinking about doing this. A, uh, do you find this useful? Is this helpful to you? And B, would you like to put somebody on this committee? committee. Um, and I think uh, to the extent that uh, the committee comes up with another charge that's not within their jurisdiction, I think that's less necessary, but still a courtesy to go to them and say, this is what we're doing. So we're not necessarily talking about the entire alternative energy committee going no. to the planning board, but. I don't think so, other than to make a report or something like right. that. But I, I think, and one thing I did want to mention is there is interest in, um, in town leadership in uh, hiring and seeking funding for sustainability. And a sustainability study, in my opinion, could and should include the study that we're talking about here of what is the unrealized solar potential. Right. You know, where, where are the potential carbon reduction possibilities in the town? I'm meeting with Derek tomorrow on another subject. I could ask him if this might be possible if you guys well i mean sustainability and alternative energy kind of go hand in glove right um you know and if you're looking at building for sustainability or having any kind of a sustainability effort in a town if you don't consider alternative energy sources as part of that mm -hmm. i think it's short-sighted so it makes it would make sense and i saw again in the bill to go back to the bills i saw um uh in, in both bills, both versions, um, um, there was language around that, around providing funding for um, for um, sustainability um, and um, tying that to the production of alternative energy. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I think that there is a nice segue to that, and I imagine that will end up in both bills because the language that I saw looked pretty similar. Um, you know, what, what I also wonder, um, you know, again, we don't know for sure until this next legislative session comes in, but we know it's going to happen. It is heading our way. Um, and, um, I, you know, I think we need to be um, cognizant of that, not just um, in terms of losing local control, but thinking about as, um, as this is coming, what is our what is our recourse if there's something that they're looking at trying to um, bring into town that we know that the citizens that we represent aren't going to like are going to be we we either need to study it and understand it and see whether it's actually a net gain and it just we need to be part of the communication around that so that people understand what's happening I think there's a lot of a lot of times people don't understand you know that um, that. Uh, uh, you know, th there would be net good from a project if, if it's done properly. Um, but but so how do we how do we work within the new guidelines, and then how do we understand what the process is for pushing back if there's something that really doesn't work for our town? And I, I think that that as that new law comes into into play, we need to understand both of those things. How can we work with it so that we it, it can help us to accomplish our goals? with alternative energy. I mean, that's why we're all here, right? Um, but also, how do we make it suitable for our town? You can't just say num NIMBY. <laughs> it, it, you know, that's, that's not going to work. So how do we balance that so we don't become an energy ghetto for Boston or New Bedford or somewhere else, um, but, that we, um, but that we have properly cited things? Um, in the interest of time, can... Can we circle off of the um, legislative? Can I get a motion to? Do we need a motion to stop discussing this, or can we keep? Mo we don't need a. Motion. I'm not a real. No. I'm no. not. A, a okay, while. let's move on. But knowing that we're going to continue to watch this and and see what happens. Um, um, we had. I, I want to go back to the draft uh, to the feedback on the draft survey. Um, 
I, I know that we have uh, something out there. I'd like to take a look at that again at our next meeting. Let's not do that today, but I'll bring it back um, in, a, in advance to the next meeting. And let's, let's look at how we could break that up and maybe look at creating uh, a version of that survey that does go directly to commercial businesses um, in the town. Um, and and um, think about uh, an abbreviated survey. I, I, I think the, the longer it is, the less likely are we are to get information. Yeah. <laughs> but if we can think of a concise way to yeah. ask commercial businesses um, and, um, and, and set that up, I think that would be smart. So I'd like to to circle back to that and maybe look at how we could break that up to both the commercial side and then also surveying homeowners as well. Um, and, and here's one of the things I am concerned about. I have been reading about um, not so much the solar uh, panel um, companies that are installing solar panels on rooftops, but there are a number of um, solar companies like Sun Power Solar which are the, um, they're the um, companies that um, rent. They, they, they receive the solar panel that you, the solar energy that you um, generate on your rooftop. So, you know, if you're feeding back into the grid, these are the people who are collecting it. Sun Power is one of the largest. Um, uh, companies in the country, and they just filed for Chapter 11 mm. um, bankruptcy, and they it left a huge number of people in California and the West um, without a company to take the energy they were di distributing, they were collecting in their rooftops. And what ended up happening, and I, I, after this meeting, I'll share the link to this story. What ended up happening is there were lots and lots of houses with rooftop solar that didn't have that didn't get connected. Um, they, you know, they, they um, were never connected to the grid to realize the savings they were promised by the solar panel people. Um, At least one of them is in Wareham. Uh -huh. So I, I think that that's something as a committee, and I'm j I just came across this article day before yesterday and then started going down the wormhole to find out more about it. Um, but I think that it would be important to find out if that, um, what, what they're calling it in the energy industry, it's called a solar coaster, <laughs> the ups and downs of the solar industry, industry that can cause companies to grow quickly and go bust just as quickly. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the question is, um, you know, part of the things that, that affect them are the interest rates um, and building codes and, um, and, and pushback. But um, with interest rates coming back down, that might not be as much of an issue, but interest rates um, um, at least partially impacted this particular company, and it was the largest um, company in the industry. So I, 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 I don't know if there are others. For the homeowner? I'm sorry? A, wouldn't that be a win for the homeowner? Company goes out of, you're leasing your roof. No, this company this, installs all this the, infrastructure. No, the, 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 that's not the installer. It, well, I, I would happily pay for interconnection if someone gave me free solar. I have solar panels, but I mean, if a, co if a company installs something and goes out of business, they don't own it anymore. You own it now. The only thing is, no, like, when you say to Eversource, okay, connect us up, they might be like, okay, we need to know who the real owner is, and that might be the stuff. Well, and it's not the, it's not the solar panel company that went out of business. Because the solar panel companies, the people who lease you the solar panels and uh, and install the solar panels, are separate from the company that receives the energy from you. Um, so if you're feeding into the grid, there's this middleman, and that's what this Sun Power Company is. Sun Power they have the same. They, as that's that. They're, um, so Sun Power is. Um, Sun Power is the. The one that takes it from your rooftop and gives and, and distributes it back into the grid to like national grid. Um, and so, and I again, I am just becoming aware of this. Uh, but the the more I read about it, the more it looks like it could be a danger. And that's something we could also ask. It's like, did you get solar installed, and what was your experience like? If we were, if we were, you know, did you 
did your company go out of business, whether it was the installation company or the, your receiver? Have you had issues with getting connected or getting the savings you were promised? Yeah. And those, so issue, on. those issues do exist in this town. Yeah. And I think a, a growing, well, there's growing consciousness of the problems associated with the solar developers mm -hmm. and, um, and installers and off takers and lots of scams going on. So going, well, and, and that's an, another question for the legislation. Is there going to be any kind of control over that? Is that, is this commission that they're going to, they're going to put into uh, place for the um, alternative energy? Is that going to, is that going to rein in some of this wild west solar panel people? That's a good question. Um, at any rate, I'd, I'd like to come back um, to at our next meeting and look at, um, look at the, the survey and how do we break that apart. And I think I, at our last meeting, Tom committed to doing a rewrite of the draft he had come up with. So maybe we can catch him before he goes off. Off to Italy? <laughs> yeah. Can I go? No, I don't want to go anywhere else for a while. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I'll ask Tom if he's already done it and ask him to send it to us so that we can take a look at what he's done since he won't be able to attend our next meeting. I think that would be not in arrears of the open meeting law, right? Since he said he was going to do that for us. It's Yeah, it's not deliberative. Right. Um, so back to our agenda for today. Um, we had a couple of items of new business. Are, are we good with... Um, the committee matters. Are we okay to move on? Does anybody want to discuss anything else that was there? Um, so um, Sherry brought up to us that we did not, we had a, a small number of committee officers. Um, Linda is our clerk. I am the chair, but we do not have a vice chair. Um, so we might want to consider, <laughs> might want to consider, is anybody not doing something yet? <laughs> I'm just left. <laughs> oh, I think that would be perfectly suitable if we Elect make Tom. him vice chair in absentia. <laughs> that would be the last I, I move that I move that Tom be vice chair of the committee. <laughs> Do I hear a second? I I don't know. Are, are we allowed to assign uh, leadership positions without someone's yeah, profession? Uh, well, maybe we can table this to the next yes. meeting when we have enough people. And so, you so, can ask him. In yeah, we could ask him, him if he'd be this. willing to be <laughs> serve as vice chair, and we can vote on it. Because he thought it was all great. An excellent idea. vice chair, given his knowledge. Yeah, his knowledge. He would be. And speaking of other people to serve on the committee. We are getting, we are shrinking. We have been shrinking um, a, a wee bit. I know we had, a, 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 but it seems like we should try to bring, especially since Sherry's had to step out as an official member, um, we should probably try to bring maybe a couple of more members on just to spread the load a little bit and bring some new blood in here. And at one point, um, Sherry, you had mentioned Carl Schultz had some interest in it, but does he have the bandwidth if we were to reach out to him and invite him to consider it? I don't know. You could, you could ask him. That's a, that would be a good conversation to have. But I, I would say on the question of size, this is a small committee now, but I think the level of conversation is really good. Are you guys good with staying small? I think it Makes it easier fine? for us yeah, I mean, to... It's fine, but if you want to ask this guy if he sounds like he's... Well, I mean, the, the upside of Carl... Uh, of Carl as he is on the planning board. Um, and it would be nice to have somebody from the planning board as a liaison. Or, or you know, I mean, even if we wanted to invite him as, a, as, a, as an occasional guest to liaise with us on behalf of the planning board, I don't know, just like we might want to liaise with the planning board on behalf of the Alternative Energy Committee. Um, it might be a smart thing, considering we have a lot of... Um, a lot of things in common. Um, the other person on the planning board who would be good is Julie Moran, who's recently on, but is a lawyer, a real estate lawyer. And uh, just don't mention Sun Power to her. 
<laughs> Julie Moran, yeah. is she a victim? Yes. Mm. Mm. Um, is it so? Just to be clear, any fit, anything we would potentially propose as a bylaw has to go through the planning board anyway, right? If it's within their jurisdiction, if it's zoning, if it's or any kind use. of zoning or land use, yeah, yeah. okay. So that yeah, it makes a lot of sense in that regard. Yeah, it? I mean, again, whether we whether we want to expand the committee to add more members, or just like we, when with the firemen, fire humans, um, were, were advising us before. Um, they weren't actually members of the committee. They were advising us on yeah. that, and maybe we maybe that would make sense. Is just it would also take um, pressure off anybody that we asked to, but maybe ask the planning board if the, if a member of their board would like to sit in with us to consult with us on what we're doing. Um, Are you yeah. the liaison to the planning board? Does it make sense for Sherry to? But ask? Are you still on the planning board? I'm liaison to You're it. the liaison to the planning board yeah, and so to us. We'll ask She's Carl. liaising all over the place. Yeah. Um, ask Carl what he thinks, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm willing to shoot Carl an email Why don't and you say, do hey, I would, you, would you like to sit in with us? Yeah. You know, we'd love to, you know, if you'd like to be a, a re I mean, we have a quorum. You know, we have enough members to, to do what we need to do. And I, uh, you know, I... I just wanted to make sure that everybody felt comfortable with our number. I, I, I do feel like we can are relatively nimble at this size, which is good. Um, but maybe asking Tom and, or I'm sorry, Carl and or Julie if they would like to liaise with us and sit in on a meeting, and we can, in advance, think about what we'd like to talk with them about. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Okay. I do want to ask you. I just want to say I'm I'm I don't have the bandwidth to be the vice chair. Would DJ, you like to be the vice chair? Would you be the vice chair? <laughs> I promise I'm going to show up and be on time and get the agendas and you ask Tom be. first. Then okay. I'll, I'll ask I'll Tom. I'll consider. I won't say no. Okay. How's that? Okay. So Tom first, then DJ. Okay. Um. So we have scheduled our next meeting. We have to, um, do we have um, do we have um, any other business that we need to consider today? Anything new that we need to think about that is not reasonably anticipated? Forty eight hours <laughs> for, for, prior to the posting of this meeting, is there anything anything that you'd like to see on the agenda for next meeting that is that we're not already looking at? I mean, if if we can get the survey, I think that'll be a good chunk of the meeting. Yeah. So let's 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 make that our primary focus at the next meeting. Yeah. And and making Tom. The and vice making chair. Tom. Yeah, vice chair. If he's it, yeah, let's fight him. Vote him in while he's in Italy. All right. <laughs> um, and well, he'll quit. Yeah. <laughs> do we do we have some kind of closure on the state legislation thing? Do we we think that nothing's well, going to happen with that until January? I, I officially. Can't. It does not appear. They could do some hard leaning and get an informal session to approve it, but I just this has a million moving parts, including bottle bills somehow. I know that yeah, the bottle bottle bills. So it has here. so many things in it yeah. that I can't imagine it's going to just sail through. Um, but will uh, his inside sources say in a week or two we should yeah. have a better? We'll know yeah, when we're cleaner bill. this week. We'll have a cleaner bill. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But at least maybe a, we should have like at least a, a, a compromise bill. I guess a standing entry on the agenda yeah. that if if something happens, we'll talk about it. Yeah. I think that's okay. So, disc if anything has happened, any updates on the legislative bills will be on the next agenda, and I'll try to make sure I get the bill numbers right in the agenda. Um, all right. Anything? So we'll do the the um, the survey next time. We'll look at if there's anything else to know about that. Um, we'll think about. Um, inviting somebody from the select board and maybe in the next agenda at uh, the next meeting let's look at what we might want to discuss with them um maybe put together uh, some uh, items that we'd like to discuss with a liaison from the uh, from the uh, planning board in the meantime i'll ask if anybody's interested fair enough mm -hmm. okay i will monitor the posting of the the powerpoint presentation that i alluded to and it could you share that with us when when that comes available perfect all right um, anything else for today? No. Nope. I move we adjourn. I second. All right.
Uh, all, all in agreement? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, we are done. Thank you. Done. You can stop the recording. Um. <laughs>